and I accidentally did this. So all they filmed was. Uh, <laughs> and also, I I forgot about this. So they requested this, and come my students in special topics. I forgot the finger puppets, the Thomas Jefferson finger puppet. Can you put on a play? I can, but you know when the time's right. Isaac Newton, Davy Crockett. <laughs> that will scare somebody. <laughs> All right, so let's review. Real quick, are there any more questions with that list? I asked you yesterday, but I'll go through a few more. Yeah. CG Boston, that's the whole thing with the militia surrounded Boston. Your bunker hill was part of that. And the, the, the colonists broke the siege when they got cannon from Ticonderoga. And that would be one of the triggers that would lead to the Declaration of Independence. The other one would be the King's Proclamation. Yeah. So what was the one about racism, like mostly how it started? Yeah, how it started. So related to your Bacon's Rebellion, the Fornication Law, Slave Codes, and uh, the class issue, don't we? Because there's a lot of this class, but by the lower class. Yes? Are you going to forget about uh, Gilbert? I'll do it here in a second. Yes? I think we kind of forgot to read this section of it because. You never, like, about yeah, and I realized I talked about the things you need to know, but that's the last set part of chapter four. On your own, you can read it and get that, but it won't be I think I thought I wrote it up and didn't. And I realized that yesterday. That, oh, shoot. Well, thank you, remind me. Yes. That's that British trying to enforce mercantilism. Mm -hmm. and, but they, and then they would try to enforce them after the French and Indian War, and that would lead to the revolution. Any others? Now, I'll do the Treaty of Paris in a sec. Finish the Southern Strategy, which I talk a lot about the Southern Strategy. It's a big deal. It'd be perfect for a short ID. Yes? The what? The Corsi back after the Boston Tea Party? Now, the punishment for the Tea Party? So that was closing Boston Harbor. Yeah. Um, Resolve the government, quartering act. British officials tried in London. Yes. What? Okay, the Declaratory Act, which is the second column? Yeah. Not bad, huh? That's where um, Parliament, even though they repealed the Stamp Act, said they're still in charge. Basically, it's a way of saying, well, we're going we're to come back. And the township duties, I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday, but the same as the acts or the taxes. Duties are just a tax, yeah. Um, are, like the short, short IDs, are we going to have the option of which ones we do? So what we're going to do for short IDs, there are going to be some that will be specifically for the Declaration of Independence, like a social contract, your unalienable rights. Maybe the, the trigger of it will actually trigger declaration. So some choices on that. And then there'll be, so that'll be some. So you have to know the Declaration of Independence, the philosophy. And then the other thing is, it's going to have then some other choices. So I think five total. And so it'll be things like, well, you know, a great one would be the Southern Strategy, which I finished today. The Tea Act and the Tea Party, because I led it so much. And fornication laws and slavery, really big deal. Mercantilism, that's pretty important. Solitary neglect, trade and national navigation laws, et cetera. Uh, I talked about the beginnings of the French and Indian War. Remember Washington and necessity and the fur trade and all that? So, probably a big deal. Those are some of the examples I'm going to have for the choices for short ideas. Yeah. And then started to what countries you the Yeah, the proclamation. So remember the Second Continental Congress sent that Ollie Branch petition. Yeah. And he ignored it by saying we're going to torture you. And since the British already left Boston, the Continental Congress said, what the heck? Let's just do it. Not British law. English law. Very good. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. That's where it was sent to the Congress after Lexington and Concord, actually after Bunker Hill, too, where the Congress sent to London basically saying, we can still go back. You know, we just want to be independent, but the king ignored it. And don't forget our short IDs. Three to four sentences, and so it gets, you know, you have to explain what it is, what it is, why it's important. You try to get where, when, don't make up a date. You know, the Southern strategy happened in 1984. No. <laughs> Don't make up a date, but give me an era 
you know, place, you'll get as much information as you can, and then in it, related to something else going on at that, at that time, put it in context. So if it's a declaration of independence, you know, something about that, you know, talk about what's going on around, like the siege of Boston, or left in Concord, or British taxes. So something like, this event led to something else that's going on at that time, or this event caused what you're writing, but related to something else going on at that time. That's context. And not in another era. You know, the Revolutionary War was like the Vietnam War. Not in a different era. In the area we're on now. Multiple choice. Give me 26 multiple choice. Let me just say it real quick. 26. And if you don't know one, put a little dot and you know, mark it. Move on. Come back to it. You know, don't get frustrated with one you don't know. Get the ones you know. Maybe pick the answer might pop in your head. Don't you love that feeling? Or go back and then narrow ones down and answer them. But don't get frustrated and try to answer one you know and then make a mistake. That's when people make mistakes on those. And that's where I see like four or five wrong in a row. It's the frustrating. Yeah. So if you, uh, you said related to something that's happening that you're trying to work with, something you want to work with, or maybe something that isn't quite of the era, but it's indirectly kind of. Uh, it has to be a direct relationship. Just what you were saying about like the Vietnam War, the way that the uh, militia fought, the way that they were kind of created over the war that was used in the Vietnam War. And, and, and I, that's that's a really good analysis of it. Yeah. But I, I want it for this era. Okay. So you can talk about the French and Indian. That is really good thought process. It really is good. But I just want to kind of focus on this. Any other questions? We happy? You want to do it now? You want to do it now? So bring in paper, pencil. What else? Notes. You can have notes up to the very moment I hand the pass out. Hmm? I think he's not that far in with us. Well, then, then I would give you get a certain grade for that. <laughs> that you probably don't want. It's hollow and round. <laughs> no, we can't have those in the It's a regular I make them round. Okay. I'm, I'm a perfectionist. Okay, as you can tell yeah. by my. That's a naval battle. <laughs> <laughs> Were you wondering what that was? I thought maybe Paramecium or maybe Amoeba. Amoeba. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so let's finish up the Southern strategy. I think, isn't that where I quit? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what battle brought in the French? Saratoga. And who was the commander of the American forces at Saratoga? Yeah, Gates. They wanted to give him command of the whole thing. But fortunately, as we'll find out in a second, Washington remained in overall command. Gage would be sent south. Who's the hero? What did Arnold try to give away that made him the traitor? Synonymous with trees. Yes. And went through all the advantages. I did say gorilla, right? Yes. And what kind of back or what did the what did the United States have to do to win? Washington finally figured it out. Survive. Because remember, they're fighting for their homeland. They know the terrain. They can hide. Just hold out. And the French, French providing supplies allowed it to hold out, even though it's just barely. Because we're going to skip a couple years in reality. 1778, 1779 were tough years for the colonists. But we jump right into 1780. I know that's why. Southern strategy. Oh, what two battles convinced Americans that they could win this war? Trenton and Those are just huge battles. Oh, and what city? What was it? Where, were the, where was the Continental Congress? How it took them? Yeah. So where did the Continental Congress do? <laughs> Run away! Yeah, they took off. And, and what? A little town called York. Actually, it's not too little anymore. <laughs> York, Pennsylvania. And uh, I've driven by York. Yeah, that's really not much of a story. Okay.
I like Pennsylvania. That's all I got to Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> They're really cool mountains with like long lines. It's really neat. So I drew this up. Did I show you this yesterday? Yeah. Isn't yeah, that good? Yeah. I drew I drew another yeah. one and I made it blurry and backwards. It's really hard to draw things blurry. And backwards. And with blue words all over. Was he a trick? Yes. Yeah. The world turned oh upside down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone stare. Okay, so 78, they took Savannah. 79, the British humiliated the Americans at Charleston. The Americans should have got the heck out of there and allowed themselves to be captured, and, and, and over 5,000 Americans surrendered. General Benjamin Lincoln. You don't have to know him. I'm just going to come back to Lincoln. No relation to Ben Franklin. And, or Abraham Lincoln. But now the British are here in Charleston. Did we say their commander? No. no. Okay, it's Lord Cornwallis. I mentioned him before when I was talking about Trenton and Princeton. Cornwallis is very competent, and his job passed by the South. But don't forget, this is 1780. He's on his own. He's got about 20,000 men, but he's got to hold Charleston and Savannah. And the thing is, do we say the army under Gates? Did I mention that yesterday? All the remnants of the Continental Militia, anything they could find, began to organize in the center of the state under Gates. The same Gates as Saratoga. And Gates is trying to organize them, and Cornwallis knows he's there. Remember all the spies. And so Cornwallis... This is actually a big move. If he leaves the sea, his supply line becomes very long. Go bring ammunition and a few other things, but where's he going to get his food? Foraging parties. And so they advance into the interior towards Camden. And at the Battle of Camden, Cornwallis actually, how about for 1880? It took 100 years for him to march across. That's, that's how they drew sevens. I think sevens. Colonial America. Seventeen eighty. Right. Yeah. So at Camden, Gates should have got the heck out of it. But Gates stood in fight, and he's outnumbered. Cornwallis had maybe 15,000 men, and then Gates had less than 10,000. And almost all of Gates' men were militia. Now, where do you put militia? In a line. Gates Gates put his best soldiers in the middle and put his militia on the flanks. And where do you suppose Cornwallis attacked? And what did they do? Run. Now, remember I told you about Washington? Mounted his horse and rode to the front of Princeton. Ben Frank, Ben Franklin, ben Benedict Arnold rode to the front of Saratoga. Gates mounted his horse and ran away. <laughs> Boom, gone as fast as he could go. He fled the battlefield. In fact, he pretty much within a year he's back in Britain. No, he didn't keep riding, but yeah, you know, good thing he wasn't given overall command. He just took off and was gone. And so, with that, Camden was a disastrous defeat for the Continental Army. The only thing that saved the army, some of the men, got dark again, one of those nightfall heads. The men fled and ran away. And Cornwallis, you can imagine, we won, right? We moved into the interior of the south and we won. But think about what's happened. As they're fighting, they're foraging along. And if farmers won't give them, their food, what do they do to those farms? Burn. They burn them down, creating more patriots wherever they go. And pretty soon there's going to be guerrilla attacks. We used to say call it guerrilla today. All along the supply line, all around this area, Cornwallis are just little pinpricks. And so they would send troops out to find the guerrillas. Well, how do you find a guerrilla? They look like everybody else. And so then they would start, okay. Maybe that little village or that, that farm was helping the guerrillas. 
So as a reprisal, a punishment, they burned that house down, they burned that village down, creating more. And that was the problem. The most famous of these was Francis Mary, who became known as the Swamp Fox. South Carolina is covered with swamps, so that's why they need to go on rice to grow there. And he would attack, hide, attack, hide, use the swamps and, um, as cover, and, the, and people would give him aid. Marion would become one of the most famous heroes of South Carolina. There's a great statue of him in Charleston. It's on this big pedestal. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it was Francis. Have you ever seen the Mel Gibson movie, the very bad Mel Gibson movie? That seems kind of redundant. Uh, uh, the Patriot? Yeah. He's loosely based upon Francis. So that's where they get that idea from. He's a pretty amazing guy. And but think about the British guy. So after Camden, they thought we won, and now they're fighting all over the place. So they spread out here looking for patriots. And I didn't put on this map because I didn't feel like it. But right here, just um, two months after Camden at King's Mountain, so we're going in October 1780, a thousand crack British cavalry who were trying to run down guerrillas were ambushed by literally hillbillies. Think of all the people living along the Appalachian Mountains. They have no idea what's going on. And then all of a sudden, here come all these British soldiers who are stealing their food, bringing their homes down, and sometimes shooting at them. And they come pouring out of the woods and attack them at King's Mountain. Now, normally you think, how could a bunch of undisciplined hillbillies? <laughs> that too is each other redundant. But undisciplined <laughs> hillbillies come and defeat crack British soldiers. But they're he it's really heavily forced. And so King's Mountain, you know, this is a southeastern mountain forest. The trees are just really close together. And so think about a forest of trees, and the British can't get their lines together. They can't organize their defense. Their style of fighting is line up in a straight line. Protect the flanks. You can't do it because of the trees. So he'll at least attack and swarm and then run back. And the British cavalry had to run. Not that this is going to turn the tide, but it's a little like trap. They won a battle. And then the hillbillies went back, they didn't care. Where are you, hillbillies? <laughs> <laughs> Their great ancestors still probably live back. Of what? Their ancestors probably live back. Not their ancestors, but their children probably. Yeah, still there waiting, waiting for it. <laughs> They're waiting. <laughs> so, January 1781. At a place called cow pens. Why cow pens? Because that's where they keep goats. And so, not to go to Liberty, at cow pens, it's just a little village. In fact, it's basically just a communal pen for cows. That's the name pen. And this, a small American force defeated a bigger British force using tactics that were used by the American Indians in the French and Indian War. Daniel Morgan, you remember I mentioned him yesterday as one of the heroes of Saratoga? He was there. And he used this tactic that just totally fooled the British. They won a cow pen. Not a big victory. I'll talk about the tactic in a second. Not a big victory, but like Princeton, we're in the fight. And then, almost as maybe more important, depends on your point of view, Gates is gone. Now, Washington has the credibility to pick the person who would try to reorganize the Continental Army down there. And he picked the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green. Why is that kind of a contradictory phrase? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their town, Philadelphia, was a city of love. But Nathaniel Green looked at it. It's a real moral problem for him. But if we truly are going to be free to practice or to have, to have true liberty, and for him also to practice um, his faith. He's a Quaker, it really was hard for him. He would turn out to be probably the best American commander of the war. Probably the best. Just a knack for it. Green began organizing the remnants of this army. Here's the big thing. He would avoid Cornwallis's main force. He just kept retreating. He retreated around South Carolina a little bit, then retreated up into North Carolina. Cornwallis's main force 
getting frustrated, can't attack him. And guerrillas just kept picking at him. So think about how Cornwallis has been going in 1781. are frustrated, Cornwallis is desperate. He's out in the middle of the wilderness, and he knows everybody hates him wherever he goes. And so, Green finally stops and fights, and Green can pick the battlefield. Because Cornwallis can't hesitate. Because if Cornwallis hesitates, he figures Green might run away. So in March 1781, by the way, all this we're talking Southern strategy, right? You get, you know, this is all the Southern strategy. March 1781, Guilford Courthouse. Same deal, it's just a local uh, courthouse. It's not even really a town. Right up here in North Carolina. And that's the Guilford Courthouse flag. That's the flag Green's men have, the one on the right. Why? Look at it. They didn't know what the actual U.S. flag looked like. Thirteen stars in a field with thirteen stripes, and they knew it was red, white, and blue because you see the Union Jack over there. Copy the Union Jack. So they just winged it. That's a cool flag, I think. That's a really neat flag. The next to it, that's Civil War. And there was no set way you put the stars back. That would happen to the 20th century. So you have all kinds of designs. That's everyone thinks the Revolutionary War flag, but actually that's just one of many designs they had. You can put the stars any way you want it. They would eventually settle with a five-point star, but not for a while. And sometimes some of the Civil War flags you would see an eight or seven point star too. Yeah, my flag. My flag. There are a lot of reasons, but probably has something to do with the Masons. We'll get you the Masons. Secret organization of Washington and much before. Yeah, there'll be a whole political party based on stopping the Masons. That's another story for the 1830s. So here we are, Guilford Courthouse. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, I have to draw you a map. Yay. I'm going to take you to North Carolina. Who's going to North Carolina? A few people. You know what it's full of? North Carolinas. <laughs> you know what it's about, right away. So, <laughs> Green knew one of the problems was, especially since he was slightly outnumbered, always protecting his flank. You have any notice he was always attacking on his flank? He picked a cleared pasture with forests on either side so they couldn't go around it. Clever, wasn't it? Basic thing, and Cornwallis had to attack. So it took away uh, the British big advantage of numbers and discipline to make a flank attack. So I'm going to draw this for you, and I'm going to draw the forest first. But even though it's March, we have live oaks, so they're green. Ready? Here we go. Here's the forest. Right? How do we know it's forest? And deer, possum, right? <laughs> <laughs> Land walrus. <laughs> Land walry. Okay, so we got filled to the brim with it. And by the way, it eats. So the field, if you just look at it, it looked flat, but it had a gradual rise in the middle. So right here was kind of like a just kind of a little hill. And so the British forces sort of down here could not see what's here. It's just a slight little rise. So Green did exactly what Daniel Morgan did at Calvin's. Morgan was wounded, and so he wasn't there. And he put his militia lined up in two lines. And they were ordered to shoot twice and then do what? Run. Run. Run because that's what militia always do. And he knew that the British would be so geared up to finally get their hands on the Americans that they would just charge without thinking. And then under the rise, or behind the rise, on their knees, so they couldn't see him, would be all his trained troops waiting. So just as the British came over the top, they could stand up and fire a volley right into their face. A volley means they all fire at once. Yeah. And the British are going to be down here. So they'll attack this way. And then... 
he had a lot of men with Kentucky long rifles. Now, Kentucky long rifles, in fact, the muskets were about this tall. From where I was, they were about five and a half feet long, if you've ever seen one. And they have rifle barrels, which means the bullets are much more accurate. Now, they're not good for, for combat, though, because the steel would actually melt if you fired it a number of times. So you had to fire it once, and you had to let it rest. But for a sniper, and so what they did in the trees is they put snipers disguised as blue dots in the trees. They just take pot shots at the British as they lined up, and what were they aiming at? Yeah, officers. But yeah, at the officers, just to cause disruption. And so Cornwallis's plan was to march to 50 paces away. And his plan actually fits right in what the Americans wanted to do. They fired twice, the British, fixed bayonets and charge. Because he was worried they'd run away. He didn't want to waste time. So it worked perfectly. They march to here, they both fire two rounds, and then the militia takes off running. And what they did is, they ran, and they went into the forest so they could hit him on the side. <laughs> and then, the British, and they're just like, yes, we got him! And they didn't have to order. The soldiers started to fix bayonets, and they just began charging little groups. They broke away from their nice lines, just yelling as fast as they can over the hill. So imagine just little pockets going over the hill like this. That looks like pockets, doesn't it? Go with me on that. Yeah. And that's when Green gave the order, his men stood up and fired right in their face. Just mowed them down. Line after line. Just totally shocked them. What did the British do then? Yeah. They turn and run. But this is where it gets troublesome for Green. His men are like, we got them! So what do they do? They charge over the hill. What turns into, this is my drawing of a melee. Little, really, this confusing fight, hand-to-hand -hand combat, men swinging with their rifle barrels out of or bayonets, shooting literally four or five paces away from each other. And Cornwallis is back here, watching this going, oh my gosh. <laughs> if he's defeated out in the middle of the wilderness, his whole army might be destroyed. And that could have horrific consequences. So he does something, to give you an idea of what kind of general he was. He had nearly 30 cannon lined up here. And he ordered his cannoneers to load up with grape shot and fire right into the melee, which is both British and Continental forces. What's grape shot? So, cannons would fire a six pound or 12 pound cannonball, is a normal size. A six pound cannonball for a six pound cannon, instead, they would put in, it was literally a bag of little muscular balls, iron balls about that big. Twelve of them. A twelve pounder would have about thirty. What would that do to human bodies? Just rip them apart. And he fired right into the melee, hitting his own soul, his own men too. And that shows you to be what kind of general he was. You gotta win. At least hold the day. In Civil War they have something called canister. Imagine like a can, a cylinder. And that'd be filled with like 300 musket balls, or even a bigger. Well, Green, not realizing I've done what I need to do, he retreated. Took fairly heavy casualties, but retreating in good order. And Cornwallis was left with this, well, heck, just an abattoir, like a slaughterhouse. Cornwallis won, right? He held the battlefield. He lost 40% of his men. This battle might have ended the war. This really could have been the one, but we're not quite done. So what happened is this. Cornwallis fled to the sea. He got the heck out of there. He had to go back to the Royal Navy. And what did Green do? No, he didn't follow. You might think he would. Cornwallis thought. Cornwallis was trying to draw him this way. No, Green just went back and liberated every place that the British took. That's why if you go to any city, that was around during the Revolutionary War, the Statue of Green. They got him. Because Green was the liberator for the United States, a hero of the United States. And Savannah they got a really cool one. I, mean, I knew there were statues, but I saw the one in Savannah. Oh, wow. I got that. It was pretty cool. And so, Southern strategy, a disaster. Everyone catch the drift on that? A total disaster. Cornwallis then goes into Virginia. He doesn't know what. Yeah. Is this like 
court. Go for courthouse, yeah. That is unusual. And you feel like you're there? What is it like to pay? There, there's a national park there. And so they have most of the fields still there because it was a pasture land. So eventually the US government bought it and now it's part of the park service. Okay. And so you can you get a pretty good idea there. They saw the flat clearing and they have pretty good monuments you can follow along. They've done a really good job preserving that. <laughs> in fact, you really can see, but you're standing here, you're standing like we're here with the British, or you can see how they totally disguised. It's a really cool place to go. And if you go to Waterloo, the British did that to the French. It's almost the same exact thing. It's a good tactic. I tried it home. <laughs> so, we're coming to Yorktown. Yorktown would be the last battle. But Guilford Courthouse, I mean, after that, back in Parliament. Members of Parliament are going, we're this is worth it. We got to go home. I mean, this is not worth the fight. We're fighting all over the world. We have this in the Caribbean, India, and every place else. So Guilford Courthouse might have been enough. But Cornwallis went into Virginia, actually joined Benedict Arnold, who was fighting patriots there. He realized it wasn't working. And so in August of 1781, Cornwallis goes to Yorktown on the James Peninsula. So do you remember Jamestown right here? Just on the opposite side of the York Peninsula, I say York, I mean the James Peninsula, right here is Yorktown. They're about 10 miles apart, Jamestown and Yorktown. He went there to wait for the Royal Navy to sail from Chesapeake and get him on. This might have been over. But Washington, half his army of the French, they're up here in Connecticut. The main British force is still in New York. Washington, actually it's the French. When the French realize this, they kind of start something in motion. Then they kind of tell Washington. And Washington is smart enough to go, yeah, good idea. Because Washington actually wanted to attack New York. But the French, their general, their commanding general, was a general by the name of, the name of Marquis, D. Rochambeau. Yes, that's an awesome name. Rochambeau. It really was. Rochambeau. And Rochambeau, on his own initiative, he begins to organize a coup that could capture Cornwallis' whole army. This is it. There was a small British fleet of about 12 ships of the line and other ships in New York. And there are about 20 down here in Jamaica. The French have about six ships of the line and about 12 in Haiti. Remember they kept those two islands in the Treaty of Paris in 1783? Mm -hmm. Or 63, I'm sorry, 63? Get the wrong war. Mm -hmm. Treaty of Paris in 1763 ending the French and Indian War. So we get the cut, kind of, you don't even know the exact numbers, but there's a navy there, navy there. The British are really worried that the French might try to steal or take Jamaica or Bermuda or crop sugar. sugar. They don't want to lose that. So they're really worried. So what the French do on Rochambeau's initiative, a small this the small fleet from Connecticut would link up with the fleet from the Caribbean under de Graal. Right at the mouth. I drew another map over. Wrong map. <laughs> I don't know, I always like kind of using the overheads are kind of fun. I don't know why. It used to be like all you have, but now I just don't like it for a change. Now really like the bragging. Yeah, like bragging. <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty good. laughs> now, if the British combine both their fleets from New York and, and Jamaica, they'll outnumber the French and be able to drive them off and they can pull Cornwallis out. But think about this time of year, right now. What season is it? In the Caribbean. What? There, there are, they are harvest, harvesting, but there's something else going on. It's hurricane season. And how do you know a hurricane's coming in 1781? Oh, you find out really fast. <laughs> Back in 1759, a French fleet of, of over 100 ships was hit in the Caribbean by a hurricane and totally destroyed it. Think about what a hurricane would do to sailing. <laughs> Are you going to risk hurricane season? 
-hmm. The French risk it. The British decided you can't risk it because then the French might take Jamaica. So they didn't go. And so off the Chesapeake, the French arrived with nearly 20 ships of the line and the British only had 12. Okay, ship of the line, naval battles weren't a heck of a lot different than land battles. They were literally lined up in rows, about 100 yards apart and blaze away with their broadsides, their cannons on one side. A ship of the line was a ship big enough to be in that battle line. Later, a battleship. And they had anywhere from 75 to 200 cannons on them, these big top heavy things. You know, think about what a hurricane would do with those. <laughs> Yeah, the tactics were really pretty bland. And they'd shoot at each other, and one side would either run away, surrender, or they would board for really nasty fighting. Not imaginative at all. But once the, when the British came out from New York and realized they're outnumbered, they turned around. Now they're gone. And then Washington had already sent a small um, force down under, remember Lafayette, who came. 19-year-old Washington movie life, and he's going to become one of the most famous men in the United States. He'd return in 1830, kind of like my return visit to where I helped liberate. The park across from the White House is Lafayette Park, named after him. But Washington and Rochambeau faked an attack here and then went down to Yorktown. And then this is a close-up of they surrounded Yorktown. They couldn't take it by force, but eventually, they got closer and closer, and Cornwallis realized it's not going to be pulled out. And when the last, or one of the most important redoubts, fortification for the British, was captured by one of Washington's key lieutenants, his most trusted adjutant, adjutant Alexander Hamilton, who then would want a king. Hamilton's an interesting man, but Cornwallis surrendered his almost 9,000 troops at Yorktown. That's the last major battle of the Revolutionary War. And what a victory. Cornwallis surrendered. Cornwallis surrendered. And basically they let them stack arms and they paroled them. And about time I'll try to destroy the surrender, but let me finish up real fast. So that's 1781, October, 1781. Gilbert Courthouse, though, was the battle that led to it. So that might even be more important battle, but Yorktown's the last one. And it's pretty amazing there were as many French soldiers as American forces. But, hey, we won. Now, two things have got to happen. They've got to negotiate a peace, but just as important, Washington has to keep his army together. So while they're beating in what city? Philadelphia. For trees. The Treaty of Paris is being negotiated of 1783, exactly 20 years after the other treaty, Washington has got to keep his army together. Britain is still in New York. Britain stayed there with almost 30,000 troops. Washington has got to be there to watch it because if Washington's army collapses, Britain can still win. They can still win or at least carve up parts of what's going to become the United States. So that's almost as big of a deal. So they're beginning to negotiate in Paris, and Washington's army is starting to fall apart because they haven't been paid. They're running out of food. They have miserable quarters. Men are deserting, and Washington's officers want to mutiny. They want Washington to lead them to Philadelphia, get rid of the Continental Congress, and make Washington king. Washington could have been king if he wanted it. But he wanted it first. No, he had no idea about that. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't want that either. He could have been king if he wanted them. Washington had a lot of flaws, but it also tells you a lot about what type of person he was. But the army was mutiny. And they were thinking, even if you don't go, we're gone. At the end of 1782, it's a little place in Connecticut called Newburgh. But all we need to just Washington's holding this army together. So there we got, we got Washington desperate to hold this army, and they're about ready to mutiny. This is, this is one of these moments. And so he calls all the officers into a little meeting hall, and basically a kind of a church, town meeting kind of thing, combination thing. So they're all packed in. It's the winter, seven, end of 1782, so December. No treaty yet. 
So all those British soldiers, and they're mad. The Continental Congress has been promising and promising. They promised land, they promised bonds, they just promised, but they have no money. So Washington comes in, you just feel the anger radiating off, radiating off. He brings in a letter, and it's for the Continental Congress. Another one we promised, you know, one of those. And the men on this, they're grumbling, they're mad. I mean, they're ready to go. It's over, because it would all fall apart if they did do this. Yeah, Washington might be king, but the United States would not have happened. So he starts reading. He looked at him, pauses, so they all quiet down, they're all paying attention to him. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out reading glasses. Kind of looks down again, and they're just I mean, shocked. He looks at him and said, This war has been long, and we all had to make sacrifices. And you know, he was noticeably old, beat by this. And he started to read. And the men were crying. He just like just overcome. And it was like, if they or sorry, if he made sacrifices, we can make one more. He didn't even finish reading the letter, he just walked out. And the mutiny was over. That's pretty good play acting, isn't it? And that what a clever man. He planned it, but it worked better than he ever could have dreamed. And you notice that the best thing I like about it, it wasn't ham-handed. Very subtle. He made them believe it was their idea. John Adams and Ben Franklin were the key negotiators. And they hated each other. I think that's really funny. Adams was really flighty and emotional and go off. Sometimes he'd be overjoyed and then be very depressed. I mean, some people, some people have said he was maybe what they diagnosed today as bipolar. I mean, really up and down. It's really hard to deal with. So Adam or Franklin just thought he was a lunatic. And then Franklin, you know, this real now but maybe the most famous man in the world. And Parisians loved him, especially the young Parisian women. So he had always had all these young women following him wherever he went. I was thinking like he had a harem. And then he would walk the streets of Paris, of course, naked. And Adams thought he was a degenerate. Yes, and Franklin was in his 70s. And I said, well, I know. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> no, don't say that out saying because it's like dress whole day. I was telling you to do that. No. <laughs> All right, moving on. But they finally got a treaty negotiated. The French and the Spanish could have cared less about the United States, so they just did it on their own. And the treaty was this: the U.S. would become independent, and this is a biggie. All of the land east of the Mississippi River became part of the U.S. And the reason that happened was because of George Rogers Clark and his Rangers, which were the name of frontier fighters back with the French and Indian War. And what Clark did was he and a few hundred Rangers, they dressed in green, by the way, in World War II, the British called their special forces commandos. So the U.S. called them Rangers. So we still have Rangers today. It comes from George Rogers' Clark. They went down the Ohio River. Most American Indians were allied with the British. They thought the British would keep the colonists from taking their land. So basically, this is just a, they just attacked every tribe along the way. It's a pretty rough thing. But they went all the way to the Mississippi River. And Clark's Rangers gave the United States a claim. That's why the United States got it. What's going to try to be all this land? Clark is going to be very famous, but then he'd be overshadowed by his brother. He wasn't Lewis Clark. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Somebody always says that. Yes. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Yeah, Corey Scott. His brother was. His brother was William Clark. So, last thing. Last two things, I'm sorry. Loyalists would get their land. Or no, not land, I'm sorry, compensation. They'd be compensated, because a lot of loyal loyalists had their land taken, or a lot of them just fled, and so just someone came to the land. And they said, they'll be compensated or get their land back. And lastly, the Mississippi River, New Orleans, 
and the Great Lakes would be open to American commerce. Mississippi River, New Orleans, Great Lakes. I know. I'm writing like this, which makes my handwriting even more unique. <laughs> but here's the problem. Commerce, trade. The problem was this. The British never left the Great Lakes. Spain played games on the Mississippi River in New Orleans. They never really enforced this. There are other parts, I'm only mentioning the key parts. The Loyalists never got their land back. They've never been compensated to this day. The treaty was not quite full, and it will always be hanging over the inadequacies of this treaty. But that's a good place to end, right? Got through the whole thing. And you want one more? Oh, God, no, I'm talking. You can help us. <laughs> the French hate, or the Americans were just disgusted by the French. The French look better when they march, they look better just in uniform, they get what they're aiming at. Remind me, I'll tell you real quick on Monday, the rest of the story, okay? Okay, that's really fun. Cats on the shirt. Huh? I knew it had to be. Yeah, that's a perfect shirt for. Yeah. I'm so excited for Nothing better than watching people make a test. You know, I just, I just feel good about yeah, this. Oh, well, yeah, the stair method, I get done pretty fast. You might know, joke.